to give out to them to encourage them during finals week. One of the most important items we're asking you to include are notes that include little details of encouragement or scripture just to help lift their spirits during that tough week. Next, we have our fall festival coming up really quickly. It's going to be on November 7th from 3 to 5 o'clock here on the church. And once again, this is a big community event. So please feel free to invite any families you know with small kids so they can come out and enjoy this event with us. We're going to have games, pumpkin painting, and a ton more stuff. It's going to be awesome. Last announcement we have for you guys today is for our Operation Christmas Child. So we still have the shoe boxes available for pickup at the church, which you can come get. Fill with toys, hygiene items, and then bring them back to us by November 8th is our deadline so that we can get them to those families we want to get them to prior to Christmas. Also, Bethlehem is currently forming new life groups. So if you're new to our community or if you're a visitor and looking to get plugged in a little bit more and learn more about what the church believes or more about God's word, we would love to help you out and get you plugged into those different life groups that we have avail available. So you can go ahead and reach out to us at office at bethlehem.com with any questions you might have so that we can help get you in touch with some of those life groups. That's everything we have for you this morning. God loves you. So do we. Have a great week. All right. Amen, amen, amen. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? We doing pretty good? All right. Let's give the Lord a praise offering today. Good morning. Good, good, Lord. Good. All right. We serve a great God, right? All right. All right. I'm Pastor Nelson. I'd like to welcome you to this morning's worship service today here at Bethlehem Church in Thornton, Pennsylvania. God is a good God, right? And we love to serve him. All right. So let's stand up and let's open with a word of prayer. <laughs> it's okay, Charles. You can come on up. <laughs> All right. Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord God, for the work that you have poured out upon us, Lord God, in your creation. And Father, today we just give you glory and honor. And we want to just love upon you today, Lord God, with our praise and our adoration and our thanksgiving. And today, Lord God, we're here to worship you both in spirit and in truth. And Father, we pray that you would equip us and empower us to do that rightfully. And so today, Lord God, we give you all that we have. And we thank you, Father God, for loving on us and, and bestowing your grace and mercy over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. Amen. Amen. We're going to stay standing and we're going to sing our first hymn. Good morning. Our first hymn is a hymn of praise by Isaac Watts. And this was first published in 1715 in a, in a book called Divine and Moral Songs for Children. But you can see by the lyrics, he had a great deal of respect for the children. And it's based on Jeremiah 10, which says, God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom. And he stretched out the heavens by his understanding. Let us sing hymn 128. I sing the mighty power of God. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. We're going to be reading from Genesis chapter 1 today, verse 27. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree that has barren fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning on the sixth day. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. Our next hymn is number 343, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace is one of the most recognizable songs in the English-speaking world. When folk singer Judy Collins decided to record it in the countercultural atmosphere of the late 1960s, it was the only song to which the members of her group knew the words. Many of us have heard the story of the poem's author, John Newton, the captain of a slave ship who called out for God's mercy when in 1748 a violent storm battered his ship off the coast of Ireland. This event marked his spiritual conversion and set him on a new path, leading eventually to ordination in the Church of England. His early life was marked by headstrong disobedience. Newton apparently honed his poetry writing craft by creating obscene poems and songs so vile that he was considered profane even by his fellow sailors. But as Joseph told his brother when they came to him in Egypt, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Amazing Grace was written 25 years after Newton's conversion to illustrate a sermon on New Year's Day in 1773. It's based on 1 Chronicles 7, 17, verses 16 and 7, 17, when King David prays, I am not worthy of what you have done for me, Lord God. So let us stand and sing together this marvelous hymn that is in included in over a thousand hymnals and is recorded by singers of every genre from folk to opera to rap and has been instrumental, pun intended, in opening a path to redemption for generations.
Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here today. You might have forgot my name. My name is Pastor Nelson. It's just been a few weeks since I've been here. Well, I've been here. We've had guests speaking. but God is good, right? All the time. Okay. What I'm going to do here is just get prepared for our prayer time. We're going to spend some time in prayer. We're going to do the Apostles' Creed. Then we're going to be uh, given you our message this morning, which I'm sure you're going to thoroughly enjoy, and I'll explain that in just a little bit. All right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God, because you are the God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and everywhere present. We thank you today, Lord God, because you have bestowed your love upon us. You have sent us your ever-loving kindness. You have bestowed upon us your grace and your mercy. And Father, we are so thankful because you have redeemed us and called us a child of your own. And God, we are so blessed today to be able to say that not only am I a child of God, I am redeemed of the Lord, I am blessed and highly favored, and God, I am here today to lift up that praise and offer you an offering unto your blessingness. And so, Father God, we thank you today uh, that we can come here and we can be in the midst of all of our brothers and sisters and be meeting online and and Lord, all of those who are watching, we just say thank you, Father God, that we have this ability to do this. And God, we just pray that you would in continue to increase, Father God, and, and, and bless, Father God, the efforts that we have uh, been making every single week, Lord God, to get further and further and further out and across the globe. Not only, Lord God, uh, do we want to do that, Lord, just to bless your name amongst the nations, but Lord, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, your son, whom you sent, that we might have everlasting life. And so, God, we pray that you would extend our reach for your purposes, not for ours. We pray, Father God, that you would extend the reach of the gospel, that others might come to know Jesus Christ. And today, Lord, we're just here in the small town of Thornton, Pennsylvania, but our reach is global. And so, Lord, we're blessed to be able to say that. And so, Father, this morning we also say to you, we're so blessed not only to be called a child of God, Lord God, but that you are the God who heals, that you're the God whose provision shall be seen, you're the God who is our shelter in the time of storm. And Father, we want to lift up our nation today. And Father, we have had a peaceful transition of power for many, many years. And we do pray, Father God, that our nation will show the world that in the midst even of disagreement and strife, that we can elect a president without trouble. And that we can have a peaceful transition of power. And we pray, Father God, for your Holy Spirit to descend upon this nation, Father God, that we might humble ourselves, seek your face, Father God, cry out, Father God, for the forgiveness of our sin, Lord, and that you would then once again bless this nation and bless this land. And Father, we pray that we would be a people of God who would continue to seek your face all the time. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would give us that peace in the midst of this storm that we're going through. And we pray, Father God, that where we do see issues, that we would be bold enough and take courage to speak out. And we do pray, Father God, where we see overreaches, that we would do the same. But today, Lord, 
We just are here to worship you, and we thank you that that's one of our rights and one of our freedoms here in this country. And so, Father, we recognize that around the globe there are many, many people who are persecuted just because they're Christians. They're persecuted if they're found with a Bible in hand. They're persecuted, Lord God, if they even mention the name of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray for the strengthening of your persecuted church around the globe. And we pray, Father God, that you would raise up a generation of people in each of those nations, Lord God, who will boldly proclaim that Jesus is the only way into the kingdom. As we proclaim that here today, Lord God, we believe that your word is the absolute truth. We believe that your word is the word of God, that it comes from you, Lord God. It is God-breathed, and it is useful for us, Lord. We believe that you are the only way into the kingdom, Jesus Christ. And we believe that every person needs to be born again. So, God, we proclaim that message, and we boldly proclaim it in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ and who is the Son of the living God and the soon-coming King. And all of this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Will you join me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. All right. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a read of a passage that's rarely used, or I should say that I rarely use, of Scripture in Ecclesiastics chapter 3. Now, I don't want any of you singing the song, okay, who every season turn, turn, turn. I don't want you to start doing that today. But I want you to hear these words. I want you to listen to them as if they're fresh and new. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain, a time to scatter, and a time to give up, I'm sorry, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Again, may the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. So this begins our three-week series on stewardship. Now, normally when a pastor says that, it's like turning on lights and cockroaches in the sea, and everybody just scatters. Because nobody wants to hear a message on stewardship, right? But today we're going to start off with something uniquely different. We're going to be covering three topics in this th next three weeks. But I want to start off with just laying a foundation. So today's message would be the lightest of the messages, not the shortest. The lightest of the messages, the easiest for you to swallow, right? The easiest for you to swallow. So I want to cover just a couple of basic things that we're supposed to be thinking about when we talk about stewardship. And I also want to give you a promise of some things that we're going to provide for you during this time. So the first thing is, is that everything that God gave to Adam and to Eve 
was theirs to rule over. I need to just slide this out of the way. That's shining right in my eyes. All right. Everything that God gave to Adam and Eve, right, he gave to them to rule over. He told them, right, be fruitful and increase. The earth is yours and the fullness thereof to rule over and to subdue. And so God had given to them his entire creation, right? He said to them, I'm going to give you every animal of land, all the birds in the air. I'm going to give you all the animals in the sea and all the waters of the earth. I'm going to give you every plant, every bush, every blade of grass. They are yours. You're going to rule over them. You're going to take care of them, right? And so the reality is, is what we, we glean from that is that God had created, that makes him what? That makes him the owner of creation. So he is the author of, he is the owner of, and he bestowed upon Adam and Eve a task. That task made them a steward over creation. And so a steward is someone who manages somebody else's property or somebody else's business or household or somebody else's something. Could be anything. And so the reality is, is that God gave his to them and they had the task of stewarding. So they could mess it up, which ironically, if you read the next chapter, they pretty much did. <laughs> we don't know how long that was, but we do know that they kind of messed it up. Okay, and so I want to I want to come to you today from the very basic premise that stewardship and that you may not have heard this before. I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody else has ever preached it this way. Stewardship is essentially about right relationships. Does that make sense? Think about that. Stewardship is essentially about right relationships. And I'm going to approach the entire stewardship campaign, the whole idea of bringing you the idea of stewardship from the scriptures from, the uh, from this uh, premise that stewardship is about right relationships, okay? And there's two things that we can learn from this story in creation. The first thing that we can learn is this, that everything belongs to God. He is creator, he is sustainer, right? So number one, the first fact that we can glean from this is this, everything belongs to God, okay? I'm glad this tie is his because I don't particularly care for it. But everything belongs to him. This tie clip, this is God's. Okay, everything belongs to him. Number two, that nothing belongs to us. We are nothing more than stewards. Okay? We are nothing more than stewards. So we literally own nothing. We think we do. We literally own nothing. Okay, so those are the two important facts that we need to bear in mind as we go through the uh, three messages that we're going to do on stewardship. Okay, so that's the fact number one. That's fact number two. Uh, and it's important for us to keep this in mind because sometimes we begin to think that these things are ours, right? We have big fancy homes. Some of us have really nice cars. Some of us have vacation homes, right? So we tend to think, okay, well, I, I began, I did that. I was able to buy that. I was able to get that. I can have a nice tie. I can have, and I can have, and I can have, and, and that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with having wealth. And there's nothing wrong with using the gifts and talents and skills that God gave you to bless you to use those things for his good. The issue that I always say is it's okay to have wealth as long as wealth doesn't have you. So if whatever you have owns you, disown it because you've now taken yourself out of right relationship. And so the reality is, is that we need to come to the, to the conclusion here that things that we have are his, and it's okay to have so long as it doesn't have us. Does that make sense? Okay, so if it begins to control who we are, if it begins to take away from our ability to serve God, then there's something wrong with the relationship with what you have. And your ability to use it. Okay, so there's something wrong there. You need to fix that. All right. And so I'm kind of hoping that someday 
that God will toss me a little bit more. I'm kind of getting tired of driving that old piece of junker over there. You know, smells like wet dog. Even now when it doesn't rain. <laughs> here's the reality. I'm not climbing up too fast, but we're, we're, we're doing all right. So here's the thing. I want us to take a look at Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to get started. All right. Here it says, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Now, we already agreed that God is the owner of all things, right? We agree that we are only stewards, right? Okay, so some of us agree, some of us don't. Okay, we'll get there. Don't worry about this. You know, It's okay if you actually speak. You can do that through your mask. You're all right. And from the time that we are young, we learn about stewardship, right? So it really depends upon how good a teacher we have. But when we're little kids and toddlers, right, we learn how to manage our toys, clean up your mess, do this, do that. We're always being told what to do, by the way. And so here's the thing. We learn how to manage what we have little by little. And so then a little bit later on in life, we get into school from junior high to high school, and then we begin to manage what? We begin to manage our homework, and we don't really have to be told anymore that we need to make sure we get this done. And then we, maybe we join the choir, or maybe we join the football team, or maybe we join some other sport, or maybe we, we participate in some other extracurricular activity. Maybe we have a job after school, and maybe we begin into that their crazy cycle of our other relationships, right? So we have friendships that we learn to manage, and they can become very complicated, can't they? So we learn to be stewards as we're growing, and then later on, maybe we go off to college, and maybe then we, we get our own apartment, and we start to understand what it's like to have a little bit of freedom, right? And we start to throw off those chains from the parents, and we start to do more here and more there. And so we learn to be good stewards by going through that lifelong process. Sometimes we don't learn very well. We make a lot of mistakes, and so we're thankful that we make those mistakes because that's when we learn the best lessons in life, okay? So we have all of that taking place. So it should come as no surprise to you that one of the foundational principles of stewardship is the stewardship of time. The stewardship of time. In fact, I would say that if you don't steward your time very well, you will not have time, no pun intended, to live life well. So I would say of time, talent, and treasure, time is the most important of the stewardship principles. You might have thought that a pastor would be saying that what you make, what you give is the most important time. Because if you don't manage your time well, the others won't matter. That's what I'm going to have to show you today, just a little bit of that. So today I'm going to kick off, right, a three-week series on stewardship, stewardship of time, talent, and treasure. How, we, how do you stewardship your time? How do you steward your talent? How do you use the things that God has blessed you with, your material blessings? And so when we talk about treasure, we're not talking about your gross paycheck. We're talking about everything you own. What do you do with your clothes? What do you do with your home? What do you do with your cars? What do you do with your vacation properties? What do you do with your yard? What do you do with the things that you have? That's treasure. And the reality is, is that God had given some things to you and you have abilities to use them either for his good pleasure or you can hoard them for yourself. But what do I do with my time? That's an important aspect of all of this. So I'm going to give you three things while we're here. Okay, so we're going to actually get down into the nitty gritty and we're going to provide you with three things and then. At some point in time toward the end of this, we're going to try to do a congregational meeting. I want to talk to you a little bit about vital congregations and what it takes to turn them around. I want to talk to you about vital congregations and what it takes to turn them around. Okay? It's important that you know 
what your chances are of turning around a congregation. It's extremely important that you know what that takes. Because if you want to do it, you would have to buy into that. You have to understand it. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to provide you with a financial report of where we are currently. Okay, that's going to be important to you. Since this has kind of been an odd year, you might be wondering, where are we? What's going on? What I will tell you ahead of time is, is simply this. We are better off than we were last year. Is that good? Can we give the Lord a praise offering there? <laughs> Even though less people are giving. Does that make sense? Hmm. And almost 20 at zero. And we were in November. Okay, here we go. Uh, what are our projections toward the end of the year? We're going to talk about a plan moving forward. That's that vital congregations talk that we're going to have. So the next thing, number two, we're going to ask you to examine your own life in the area of time, talent, and treasure and ask you to talk about how is it that you are doing with that so you can talk to yourself about that, okay? So one time it's okay for you to talk to yourself. We'll give you that. Number three, we're going to place before you an opportunity to challenge yourself to make a commitment onto the Lord and his work here at Bethlehem. Okay? So the three things that we're going to do through the stewardship campaign over the next three weeks and beyond that into December. Today we're going to talk about time. And we just read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which basically says that there is a time for everything. Does that make sense? There's a time for everything. How many of you have been able to escape time? just keeps ticking away, doesn't it? There's absolutely nothing that you can do to stop it, right? How many of you don't like change? <laughs> We're not very good at that, but yet every moment that goes by, everything changes. We think it's the same, but we can never really go back and get it. So time just keeps on ticking away, right? And I think what's really important for us to understand is that I don't think that we as a people manage our time very well. It seems like we wax and wane from chaos and disruption to just a little bit less chaos and disruption. Does that make sense? Okay. How many of you have heard this? Well, I wish I could clone myself. I'm moving back, Malou. I'm moving back. <laughs> How many of you wish you could clone yourself? How many of you have ever had to be in two places at one time? Right? You've got to have your son in one place and your daughter in another and somebody in your household is out of town having a good old time while you're trying to manage everything, right? How many of you have heard somebody say to you like this, you just got to learn how to prioritize your time, Janice? How many of you have heard that? How about this one? Here's a better one. Charles, you just need to make time for what's important. Those are great things to hear, but wouldn't you just like to, ooh, that's not helping. That doesn't help me. If you want to help, pick her up and take her to practice, right? If you really want to help me, go home and cook me some dinner, and I'll come home and eat. I have some things that I can get done in between, right? And so we have all of this stuff that's going on, and what's really important for us to understand that time is the foundation of stewardship. Time is the foundation of stewardship, because if you don't have the time and you don't manage it well, you're not going to have time to use your talents or your treasures for the Lord because you're going to be too busy keeping up with the things that you forgot to do. Make sense? Time is number one. Time is important. Now, I want to just take you through just a little bit of a crazy walk. There are how many hours in a day? 24. Let's see how good you are. Number two, how many minutes are there in a day? 24 times 60, 1,440 minutes. Got it? How many seconds? 86,400 seconds. How many days are there in a year? 365. How many hours are there in a year? I got to look. 8,760 hours per year, 525,600 minutes per year, 31,536,000 seconds per year. How many of you have been doing that for more than 80 years? <laughs> How many of you are approaching that? Right? There you go. I got it. Now we're getting there. We're getting there. A 
According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, here's we go. You ready? The average human being will spend eight hours a day sleeping, one hour and 30 minutes a day eating and drinking. That includes making the food. One hour and 45 minutes a day on household chores and things. That includes paying the bills, uh, fixing things, folding laundry, doing all kinds of things throughout the house. And three to five hours a day watching TV. And the average American spends less than 15 minutes a day on religious activities. C. Peter Wagner and George Barna did a study on the American pastor. The average American pastor prays less than 15 minutes a day. Is it any wonder that the American church is powerless? Less than 15 minutes a day. There's one more in this here, a little bit of a statistical thing. On charity items, the average American will spend less than 15 minutes a day. Okay? So let's just recap that just a moment. We'll spend eight hours in bed, ten hours at work, and three to five hours watching TV. Hmm. Plus, for those of you who come to my sermons, you get an extra hour sleep a day. <laughs> All right. So there is an important thing to stewardship, right? So time really is important. Time is important. You can't make more time. You can prioritize it. And stewardship is essentially prioritizing our time. Really? That's really what it comes down to, prioritizing our time. Now, to manage it well, you can run through your day very easily, right? If you really do a good job of getting the things that are important in, in line and manage your time well, you can pretty much run through your day pretty easily. If you don't, you're going to blow up your day. And even if you do manage your time very well, if you have kids, you know that in a heartbeat, all oh, that could fall apart, right? Or you might have a dog that just decides they're going to run down the street this day, and you're already late for work, okay? So there's all kinds of things that can throw off your time. But if you do on a regular basis learn how to steward your time well, you will have time for the important things of life. Okay? We want to make sure that we get that. Okay? If you have this restlessness and you have this crazy idea that you've got to get all things done, you're not going to be living life well. You're going to be living life on the edge all the time. All the time. So I, want to, I would be remiss to say, though, that it would be always that way. But the reality is that we all know that, in general, if we do well with our time, it'll be okay. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says this. Thus the heavens and the earth and the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work in which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it. Because in, in it, he rested from all of his work which God had created and made. So I guess what I really want to relate this to is that if you learn to steward your time well, you'll learn how to rest. Now, I think, in my own opinion, we all need rest. We all need that. We all need to learn how to be good resters. And I believe that's why God decided, who didn't need to rest, chose to show us what rest is like. So he didn't need it. I personally don't think he worked very hard at his creation. He just spoke it and it came into being. But the reality is, is that he rested. And he taught us a very important principle of life. You need to rest. Okay? But I think we as a society have somehow forgotten the Sabbath. In fact, we've packed it with more things to do. And somehow, as parents, we just seem to think that if we just can get our kids to do one more activity on Sunday, if we can get our kids to just do one more football game, one more soccer game, one more basketball game, one more wrestling match, if we can just get them to do one more volleyball game, if we can just get them to play in the band, if we can just get them to sing another choir event, if we can just get them to do some sort of other extracurricular activity, if we can just get them to do one more thing, they're going to be so much better off in life. 
They're going to be wonderful. In fact, they might even go to college and do this. And they're going to learn to do even more when they get to college, and they're going to waste even more of their time packing their day with more stuff. Instead of teaching them that God rested. I hate to break it to you, folks, but it is highly unlikely that any of your children are ever going to make it to be a multimillionaire playing a sport or singing in a rock band. It's highly unlikely. In fact, less than 1% of our nation's kids reach that phase. It's probable or possible, not probable, and it's highly unlikely. And so wouldn't it be better if we taught them then instead of desecrating the day of God, to teach them how to rest and how to organize their life in an orderly fashion and give them a proper foundation from which to teach their next generation. Because the generation before us failed at that, and they just started packing. I'm just got to get more, more stuff, more stuff, more stuff. Come on, we got to get out the door. Let's go to family dinner. No, we can't. We've got to get to the game. We can't do that. No, we got to get to the choir practice. No, we can't do that. We got to get the play practice. No, we can't do that. We got to do this. No, we can't do that. Why? We can't do that. God said rest on this day, and here we have, def- we have just desecrated it. We've packed it with garbage that is not going to make a hill of beans to anything. I guarantee you that playing that one more game or singing that one more song is not really going to matter. In the grand scheme of things, what you've really done is you've taught your children to disobey God's word. That's what we've done. And we've shown them that God said rest, and we said, we don't need that. Well, we'll do it on Saturday. No, you won't. You'll cut the grass on Saturday so you can get all this running around done on Sunday. And then... Praise God, Giant is open 24-7 because at 1 a.m. I can go get groceries. Why? Because I filled my whole day with work, 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 games, 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 practice, 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 choir this, choir that, this, that, and every other thing instead of being together and teaching our children this is God's day. Time is about right relationships. Stewardship of time gives us a proper ability to be in right relationship with God. And if we can teach our kids that, I guarantee you, the rest of their life, how they treat their husbands, how they treat their wives, how they treat their children, what they do in their homes, and how they work and how they live will be so much better if they could just learn to be good stewards. If they could just learn to be a good steward, they would be far better off than anything else that you could give them. Because whether they're wealthy or poor, they'll learn how to treat others and live life well. That's important. We're about at the halfway mark. (laughs) Here, I'll think. What's the first thing all of you did? Time. Why? You got somewhere to go? (laughs) You got a roast in the oven? (laughs) You probably don't even cook on a Sunday anymore. Woo. All right. He's hitting below the belt now, isn't he? (laughs) All right, here we go. So when it comes to the concept of stewardship, more so than time, talent, and treasure, or more so than talents and treasures and skills and all those things, I think that I've made a pretty strong case that time is important. If we don't really get those, you're not going to have time to serve in some other form, right? And so uh, what I want to do is, is, is just go over a couple of things that will close this message out. Number one, time is the essence. If we get that right, we'll start off in a solid foundation. We'll be able to do so much more if we just learn how to manage what God gave us. Because you can't create more time. All you can really do is arrange it in a particular way. So we want to look at that as a measure of stewardship. And I think that we've established the fact that, uh, that time is an important element to our stewardship. So the question is then is how do we use our time? We can look at it from two perspectives. The first one is, is uh, how do we manage our time? And the second one is then is how do we bring the Lord into the time that we have? So we're going to look at it from a stewardship principle, and we're going to look at it from the idea of a tithe. 
what's a tithe? Anybody know what a tithe is? Ten. Right. So if 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 you're giving nine percent, are you tithing? No, it's not a tithe. In fact, you can't even call it tithing. If you're giving two percent, it's not a tithe. If you're giving twelve percent, it's not a tithe. A tithe is ten. That's all it really means. I hate to tell you, and I hate to burst your bubble, but that's what it means. But the reality is, though, is we can use that as a principle from which we base all of the things that God has given to us. With time or talent and treasure, or treasure, not treasurer, treasure, that God has given to us, we can uh, apply that principle. So if we did that with time, we would say, oh, we have 2.4 hours per day. We have 16.8 hours per week. Well, we can look at this from that perspective and say, okay, well, how am I going to fill those slots? Well, if I wake up every morning and spend an hour with the Lord, I can say, well, that's seven hours. If I take an hour with the Lord every night, that's 14 hours. If I do a daily devotion or a prayer time or scripture reading, or if I'm serving the church somewhere, or if I'm leading a small group, or if I'm doing something else, I'm filling in that time. It's something I'm giving on to the Lord. So I can use that then as a measure of, to kind of judge how well I'm doing with my time. God, I'm giving you this. This is all I have to give you. I gave you my time. And so therefore, I'm going to put my time into studying for that small group, studying for this. I'm going to put my time into being an usher or a greeter or someone who works on the team or somebody who sings up front. I'm sure you guys spend a little bit of time at home, at least five minutes before you get here practicing, right? You probably spend a little bit more time than that. And see, all of that counts into the idea of how we stewardship our time to serve the Lord. And so you can go down through and say, well, that's more of a legalistic approach. Well, you're right. But it's also a good way to put on your to-do list. Well, I'm going to wake up. I have a habit every day. I like to be up by 530. It doesn't always happen. So there's the grace piece of it. And so if I'm up at 5.30, great. If I'm not, I'm okay with it because I know that what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go over to the prayer room and you might be maybe driving through the parking lot at 6 a.m. You're going to see a light on over there in the, in the middle of the house on the second floor. That's me in my prayer room. And I'm going to be there reading the Word of God every morning and I'm going to be in there praying for you every morning. And that's what I like to do. And that's Monday through Sunday. And that's a way for me to spend time with the Lord before I come over here. Now, I have the great privilege of being able to say that all of my work in some way, shape, or form is for the Lord. And so you can look at it that, in that way. But for those of you who have regular jobs where you're not into the religious world but in the secular, there's ways that you can integrate into your time at work as well, ways that you could do that. You might have a Bible on your desk. In some places, that's not even allowed. I used to keep my Bible right on my construction desk or even in my tool bag. And so we can do stuff like that that helps us to understand this is how we put our time together. The second way that we can do this is to say that I'm going to I'm going to allow God to infiltrate every second of my day. So I want to read. I want I don't want to take credit here. Uh, Carol, let me see here if I can get it. Where is it? OK, Carol says that good stewardship of time involves more than just traditional spiritual disciplines. But it should be considered in everything that we do, how we prioritize family time, generosity, relationships, what we do during our leisure time, all of these mundane things should point to good stewardship of time. Okay? I think you need both. I think it's important for us to say, I'm going to take some time and I'm going to set it aside and I'm going to do my devotion. I'm going to read the word of God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to serve in the church or in a charity. I'm going to serve in some way, shape or form. I'm going to come to prayer meeting. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I think that's important. But then at the same time, in every moment of our lives, we be we're living as Christians. We're living in a way that's important to bless the people around us. I'm going to bless my children. I'm going to bless my, my pets. I'm going to bless my neighbors. I'm going to bless my, my spouse. I'm going to do everything I can to use every moment of my time to be a generous person to others, to be graceful and merciful to others. I'm going to use that. 
And so if we can infiltrate both of those together, if we can, I'm saying not infiltrate, but integrate both of those together and put them in, you have a pretty good and sound principle for stewarding your time. You've got your to-do list, and you've got everything that you do on your list. And in the end, what we really want to be is a person of God who glorifies God with everything that we do. That's what we want to do. I believe that stewardship is about good relationships. And when we steward our time well, it allows us the ability to meet all the other needs that are out there and match them with our gifts, our skills, our abilities, our talent, our treasure. If we don't get this right, we might not have time to do a small group in our house. I might not have time to serve as an usher. I might not have time to sing in the choir. I might not have time. And what a shame that would be for the Lord gave you and he called you to be steward. Everything is his. Every 31 million seconds per year is his. He just asked you to be a steward of that. How well do you steward your time? I want to challenge you to take this next week and examine the way that you spend your time. I know when we do financial peace and when we look at Larry Burkett's material from Crown Financial Ministries, one of the things that they'll say to you is to take your checkbook and go down through and list all the things you spend your money on and you'll start to find what's important to you. If you were to do the same principle with your time, you're going to find what's most important to you. I hope you'll stay with me during the next three weeks of our stewardship challenge. And especially those of you who are at home, because you kind of have the ability, as Gail said, to pause. <laughs> I called you out. <laughs> but praise God uh, that he is so gracious and so kind to us. I'd like to take just a few moments to share with you the uh, communion ceremony. So if you're at home right now, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and get your communion elements ready. And if you're sitting here today and you need a communion element, put your hand up. One of the ushers will make sure that you get it. We do have some right here. You can grab them if you need them. They're available. I'll have, the, um, I'll have everybody get ready for their closing out the service as well. So I'm going to begin with the great Thanksgiving. I'm sorry, I'm going to begin with the invitation. Um, so here it goes. Christ our Lord invites all to his table, all those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your, lo your love. And we have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. And free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Christ has died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. And in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples. And he said, Take eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of me, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the great mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of both bread and wine. Make them be for us the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Father Almighty, both now and forevermore. Oh, boy. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Then likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. At this time, I'd like you to take your wafer and I encourage you to partake of the broken body of Jesus Christ. At this time, I encourage you to take the cup, his blood that was shed for you and drink At this time, I'd like to invite the singers to come on up to the front as they lead us out with our last hymn, and then I will come back up with our dismissal. Good morning. Here I Am, Lord, was written in 1979 and published in 1981 by 31-year-old Daniel Shute. He was asked by a friend on a Wednesday to write a song for a diaconate ordination mass on Saturday. No pressure, right? And his friend wanted him to include images of the word of God, the light of Christ, and the bread and wine. As was often the case, Daniel turned to scripture. Though Isaiah 6 verse 8 states, who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. Daniel actually thought about the prophets such as Jeremiah. He knew that though the prophets were chosen by God, they often had felt self-doubt, which is why Daniel changed the phrase to, Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? When we are in doubt, we look to the Lord for help and guidance. 
And so it is written in the hymn, I will go, Lord, if you lead me. Please stand if you are able and join us in singing hymn 589, Here I Am, Lord. By the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in deepest sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright, who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will. I might be the first pastor in history to start off a stewardship campaign and have forgotten to take the offering. (laughs) 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 There we go. (laughs) If you would, we'd love for you to take up your offering. You just place it in the box in the back. And if you are at home, you can mail it to, to us at 4 West Town Road here in Thornton, Pennsylvania, 19373. If you didn't catch that address, you can go to our website at www.bebethlehem.com. There's a give tab there. You can go onto that 
and you can send your donation in through there. So there you go. Lord, we pray that you'd bless and honor that offering, even though, Lord, I forgot to take it. Go in peace, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you.